This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. With the supersize me imagination knows it. I'd argue that people whose entertainment needs can be satisfied with American Idol and the old tubola, or a wild and crazy night out to watch the corn patch players put on the sound of music, are afflicted with imaginative myopia. Those of us who feel more, and see in darker spectrums, may be sick puppies, but we're also lively puppies, brave puppies too, because we keep on trucking in the face of everything we know can go wrong. For us, horror movies are a safety valve. They are a kind of dreaming awake, and when a movie about ordinary people living ordinary lives skews off into some blood-soaked nightmare, we're able to let off the pressure that might otherwise build up until it blows us sky-high like the boiler that explodes and tears apart the Overlook Hotel in The Shining. The book, I mean. In the movie, everything freezes solid. How dorky is that? We take refuge in make-believe terrors so the real ones don't overwhelm us, freezing us in place and making it impossible for us to function in our day-to-day -day lives. We go into the darkness of a movie theater hoping to dream badly, because the world of our normal lives looks ever so much better when the bad dream ends. If we keep this in mind, it becomes easier to understand why the good horror movies work, even if they do so, as is often the case, completely by accident, and why the hundreds of bad ones just don't. Expensive CGI effects, elaborate makeup jobs, and exploding blood bags won't scare anybody over the age of fourteen three years younger than you have to be to get into an R-rated movie. The kids have seen it all before. It's boring. If a horror movie is going to work, there has to be something in it beyond splatter. Either by pure chance, Toby Hooper's The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, or by pure genius, Sam Raimi, Steven Spielberg, some filmmakers are able to reach that something. They grope into our subconscious minds, find the things so terrible we can't even articulate them, unless you've got the money and the inclination to spend twenty years or so on a psychiatrist's couch, that is, and allow us to confront them. Not directly, though. Few of us are able to look straight into the eyes of the Gorgon. Humans deal better with symbols. The cross equals Christianity. The swastika equals Nazism or Nazism, if you're Brad Pitt and inglorious bastards. A number three decal on the back window of your pickup says you still miss Dale Earnhardt. That being the case, the central thesis of Dance Macabre, written all those years ago, still holds true. A good horror story is one that functions on a symbolic level, using fictional and sometimes supernatural events to help us understand our own deepest real fears. And notice I said understand and not face. I think a person who needs help facing his, her fears is a person who isn't strictly sane. If I assume most horror readers are like me, and I do, then we're as sane or saner than those who read People, their daily newspapers, and a few blogs, and then call themselves good to go. My friends, a vicarious obsession with celebrities and a few dearly held political opinions is not a useful life of the imagination. That's the life of a beetle that just happens to have opposable thumbs and the ability to count to ten. I'm sure a lot of the so-called realists who run the world think we're cracked, pervo, and possibly ready to shoot up the local high school when they see us paying for a magazine with a decomposing monster on the cover. But that's their problem. I don't know about you, but as far as I'm concerned, everything's cool with the kid. I'm all for make love, not war, as long as I can have Jason and Freddy. The American Idol folks can collect all the Care Bears they want. I like my Fear Bears. Besides, how can you not love a genre where a movie, The Blair Witch Project, made for under $100,000, can scare the bejabbers out of the whole world and gross a mind-boggling $250 million? That's either pure democracy or pure anarchy. Pick the term you like best. I think they're both beautiful. 
Here is a case where the low budget and unknown acting troupe became integral parts of the film's success. There's nothing hyped up and phony about Blair.